Hi, so we're ready to look at um, section 1.5 um, titled bias and sampling. So what we want to be able to do is be able to explain the sources of bias and sampling by the end of this lesson. So just to remind you of, um, of the goal of sampling, right? The goal of sampling is to obtain information about a population through a sample. Right, so we get a sample and try to find out what's going on um, in the population. Right? And so far we've talked about some sampling methods and, and, and some things, but we haven't maybe talked about some of the problems that can arise by, by doing a sample. So that's what this um, section is going to cover. So then if the results of the sample are not representative of the population, then the sample has what we call bias. Right? So there are really three sources of bias in sampling. We can have sampling bias, non-response bias, and also response bias. So let's go over what each of those mean. Um, so the first one, um, is sampling bias. So sampling bias means that the technique that you use to obtain the individuals to be in the sample tends to favor one part of the population over another. Right? So the methods that you're doing, um, it's, it's not um, really representative of, of everyone in the population. Right? So that's why randomness is is important there. Um, you know, any convenience sample that you're going to do is going to have some kind of sampling bias because the individuals are not chosen at random, right? So that's important to note. So the next thing uh, we want to talk about um, is under coverage. Right. So. So under coverage results in sampling bias, and under coverage occurs when the proportion of one segment of the population is lower in a sample than it is in the population, right? Um, so maybe, if I give you an example, let's say there are 65% of Marion Tech students are female, but if you do a survey and you get a sample, and let's say only I don't know, 40% female respond to your survey and 60% are male, then that obviously could have some kind of sampling bias. And there would be some under coverage in the female population then, right? So um, that's just one quick example that comes to mind. All right? And there are some examples in the text um, in this section to read over about sampling bias. So if you read over that, um, one, if you remember one example was using the Literacy Digest um, to predict the 1936 presidential election. So that was Roosevelt versus Landon. And the Literacy Digest, they pulled their subscribers. Um, they went through a telephone directory and also um, pulled the um, automobile owners. And that's how they you know, built their, their list. And um, it turns out that there was some sampling bias there because um, during that time period, um, you know, the, the people that were um, subscribers to the Literacy Digest and also owned a telephone and owned an automobile were typically um, of the Republican Party. So they um, tended to vote for Landon, um, who, who was a Republican um, candidate. Um, so that just had some, some sampling bias in that, right? So um, the techniques that we use, that, the, you know, that technique tend to favor Republicans over uh, Democrats. So that impacted uh, the results of the study. Another thing to think about is telephone surveys are pretty popular. You probably get maybe a lot of calls, especially if you're a registered voter, you know, during um, an election year, a primary election year, you might get a lot of um, phone calls, trying to do surveys, um, but something to keep in mind there is it doesn't it doesn't um, count in 
those that maybe don't own a phone and the homeless, right? So certainly there's a lot of people who do own a phone. Um, but uh, it, it doesn't allow for those people to be in um, the survey at all, right? So there's definitely some, some bias there. All right, so then um, the next uh, fill in the blank I have here is this is frames. So remember frames, a frame is a list of all individuals in the population. And sometimes we can get those, um, and, and sometimes they're not easy to obtain. But even if it's easy to attain, like for example, if I wanted to have a list of all registered voters in Ohio, you know, theoretically I could get that list, you know, if, if I worked or, you know, had the rights to get that list, I could get that list. But then um, something to keep in mind is why it's difficult is the frame is a snapshot in time, right? That, that actual list is going to change. So if I ask for the frame today, um, you know, right now, and then I'm planning out my survey and maybe, you know, I can't get to doing the survey for another week. Then, you know, I've, um, I, I've already lost and that list is not up to date, um, because, because some people probably registered to vote in that, in that time. So, um, frames are hard because they, they're not fixed. They're static, right? They can change. So then the second thing item from the list was non-response bias, right? So that's the next thing we want to define, right? So non-response bias exists when individuals selected to be in the sample who do not respond to the survey have different opinions from those who do. Non-response can be improved through the use of callbacks or rewards slash incentives, right? Um, so in other words, you know, the people that aren't responding, um, you know, that could impact our survey because, you know, maybe a particular group that feels a certain way uh, chooses not to respond. And so we're not able to capture, um, capture that viewpoint, capture that data um, from, from those that's not going to be in our sample. So an example from that in the book is it talked about in the Literacy Digest. Um, that when they were estimating um, or doing that poll for the presidential election in 1936, oh, excuse me, they sent out more than 10 million questionnaires, and then um, they only received 2.3 million back. So if you take if you take 2.3 million and divide it by uh, 10 million. Um, you're going to get, so this is equal to 0 0.23, which is 23%. Right. So then um, I have a list here of how to improve non-response bias. Um, so number one, um, we can try surveying again. So try surveying again. And if you try surveying again, I would recommend, you know, doing a different method. And then also, um, maybe you could change up the time. Right, so for example, let's say, um, I don't know, you tried um, a survey by calling individuals maybe on Monday at 8 a.m. and you didn't get a lot of good, sur uh, a lot of, you know, didn't get a good response uh, from that survey. You might try, you know, changing the method. Maybe you try emailing, or maybe you try calling um, on a Tuesday night at, you know, like 7 p.m. or or something, right? So you kind of change it up, trying to gather um, 
more more information right also changing your method and your time could could just help you get a better pool of different kinds of individuals right so um, for example, if you do email versus calling versus in person, some people, some groups of people respond better to different things, right? So, um, like if uh, a survey was sent to my my mom by email, she probably wouldn't wouldn't answer that, right? Where if I got a survey by email, I would be more tempted, right? I'm a little more tech savvy, so forth. Um, so then, another um, way to improve non-response bias is to offer an incentive. Right, and this could be money. Um, so I'll give you a dollar if you answer my survey or ten dollars. Maybe it's a drawing. Right, so if you answer this survey we will um, you know, enter you in a drawing for an iPad or something, right? So trying to make it worth worth people's time. Um, some people might give you a small gift card. If you fill out the survey, we'll give you um, a five dollar gift card to Amazon or, or something like that, right? So those those are all kind of things. So you just offer some kind of incentive. You know, every person maybe gets a gift, or maybe um, you know you you're putting them in a drawing um, can help get responses. The third thing is you can try to explain how information can be used. Right? So, for example, if I was trying to do a survey on campus um, for, um, let's say, trying to get like a, a dining hall or um, some kind of food service on on campus. Um, if I was doing a survey on that, it might be helpful for me to explain and tell students like, "Hey, we're trying to gather information and see about the possibility of adding a food service um, on campus," and that might uh, get people more engaged um, if they know where, where how the information is being used. Right? If they think it's uh, uh, basically worth their time to fill out the survey, um, so that's kind of an incentive as well, right? So. Um, sometimes you know you might get a cover letter or something in the survey if it's mailed out or emailed out or something that kind of explains that. Right, you don't have to go in specifics. Um, you know, tell tell everyone all the specifics, but just tell them enough to get them interested in and in why um, they should spend spend time to do the survey. So then the third type of bias. Excuse me is response bias, right? So that's here. So response bias exists when the answer on a survey um, do not reflect the true feelings of the respondent, right? So types of response bias are interviewer error, misrepresented answers, wording of questions, order of questions or words. Um, so in other words, you know, if if I want to, you know, ba basically the data is not capturing what the person really wants to say, right? If you will, or what what they what what the real answer is. So the first one to look at interview error. Um, you know, just some some notes on that is that it's important to use. So you need a trained. Third party interviewer. Right, that would be the best case scenario. So, having some training um, is good because a good interviewer, good interviewer, um, can elect responses. and make um, them feel comfortable to give truthful responses.
right? So that's you know why you want someone that's trained so they can they can do that um, effectively. But also, why why do you want a third party interviewer? So let's say um, I worked for I don't know like a car car company, car salesman company, or um, really any company, right? And I'm trying to sell a product, and um, I I have one of my employees do do these sir do these interviews and I report that 90% 95% of the people who buy my product uh, recommend this product to others or, or something of that sort um, so you know it's good to have a third party that that doesn't really have an interest in the results of the survey for for obvious reasons right we don't want to have um, that kind of interview error either where the interviewer is just kind of not not listening or or you know kind of not being truthful in, in what they ca are capturing. So another um, another one to look at is misrepresented answers. So in general, naturally, people will inflate things or underreport things. So for example, if I ask everyone's salary right now, Typically, people will inflate uh, so people oops sorry huh, it's not wanting to let me draw hang on All right, so sorry, my um, drawing monitor is not working right, right at the moment to to write these answers down. So I'm just going to type them. It's probably be easier to read anyway. Um, so we are on misinterpreted answers. So as I was saying, you know, oftentimes you know people uh, will inflate their salaries, right? So if I did a survey, asked you to tell me what your salary was, typically you don't know your salary to the penny for one. And, and also, um, a lot of people like to inflate those to sound better, right? Or they make more money because apparently, you know, that's better. Um, another thing that, um, you know, people will also um, underreport items. So, for example, if I ask someone their weight and if, you know, they're self conscious about that, they would probably underreport um, that. Um, so, underreport your weight, right, is one example. Um, and also, some people will overestimate their abilities, right? So I don't know if I asked you how many um, I don't know how many push-ups you can do in a minute, how fast can you run a mile? Um, I don't know, just those kind of like things that people like to to brag about. Um, I, I think just just have pressures to answer things a certain way. Um, but they might not be truthful, right? and that causes bias. It's mis misrepresented answers. Um, right, so then um, the next item, three, is looking at wording of questions. So some things to keep in mind is that we need um, neutral and balanced questions, right? So, for example, how you word a question can influence how someone answers the question. Um, like, if you, I don't know, said like, "I'm against people who receive speeding tickets." Have you re have you received a speeding ticket or you know something like that? They need to be very neutral, so you don't know um, what position or you know, what side of something you're on. And also, it it gives like an equal weight, like equal balance to both options, right? So it's better to avoid like no, yes answers. Like, um, I don't know. Like, have you ever received a speeding ticket? It might be better to ask like, um, how many speeding tickets have you received in the past year or your entire t driving career? Those, those kind of things, right? Um, so you want to you want to you know have have a neutral and balanced question because the wording can persuade people to answer a certain way, right? So 
wording can persuade people to answer a certain way. Right. So something else to keep in mind um, is the ordering of questions and also the ordering of words. So the order of questions and words and choices um, can impact the answers chosen. So for example, you know, people tend to choose earlier choices. Right? So, you know, if you give like a multiple choice question like A through E, um, it's good to mix up those options because some people might, you know, just, you know, tend to choose like A and B over D and E cuz they appear earlier, right? For for multiple reasons, you know, maybe they're not reading the whole thing. They're just kind of skimming like, oh, that answer sounds right. I'm, they don't even read the others. Um, also, um, depending on how a question's worded, it could influence your answer to another um, question. right? So maybe you know, you've taken an exam before. You read one question and then you read another question. And from reading that second question, you change your answer to the first question. Right? Um, so, you know, so things, things, things of that sort could also um, impact this. So if you if you mix the order of the questions and also the order of the words, it kind of balances out um, those those issues. So then the type of question also plays into this. So we have really two types of questions. We can have an open. Uh, question which an open question um, I'll allow the respondent to choose his or her response right so think like an essay question right where a closed question response the respondent chooses from a predetermined um, list of responses. Right? Think like multiple choice test, right? Or question. Right? So that'll help um, help you remember the difference between those two. So some things to keep in mind. Um, with with an open question, is that there are you know typically going to be too many different possible answers, right? So that's maybe a con of an open question. Maybe you get a whole bunch of different answers, but um, something to keep in mind with a closed question is that you're you're forced to pick a choice, even if it isn't know your choice right so in other words you kind of like settle for a choice and that and the best choice with the choice you pick might not actually um, you know fully answer the question how you would like right so um, a recommendation for closed questions is to first do a pre survey with open questions to obtain the most popular choices. Right, so basically a recommendation is do a pre-survey with some people and make them open questions so you can gather what they what they want to say or write about that. And then um, you can use that you use those results to pick out what your choices should be. Right? Maybe you think of choices maybe um, you come across choices that you didn't consider before. Right. So then the last thing um, on this page, and it's not necessarily a 
not not technically a response bias, but it's definitely definitely can impact the responses is what we call data entry error. Right? And you can try to minimize data entry error by having some kind of electronic um, you know, survey, even then it could still could still happen. Like if someone is cleaning up results, um, they could make an error. But basically data entry error is when you're doing something on paper and then typically, you know, we want that to be into a computer program somehow. And, you know, a common one is where people impose numbers. So there's an example here that, you know, maybe instead of writing 39, someone writes 93. You know, all, all those kind of things uh, could happen. All right, so looking at the next page, something that's important to, to think to, to note and think about is that a census can still have bias, right? Um, we've really been talking about samples here, but you know we've talked about before how a census, I you know theoretically would be, you know measuring everyone in the population, but that's not really possible. So even a census, you know, is gonna be gonna be a sample regardless, just a really big sample, if you will. But there's going to be some response bias, right? So for example, you could have some confusing questions on a census. Um, also, you can also have non-response bias. So, you know, like problem with not being able to include the homeless um, in the, in, in a, you, you know, in the, in a, in a census. So I'm thinking specifically about the U.S. census, but it could be any, any census. Right. So now what I want to do is define two types of errors that occur in sampling. So the first one is called non-sampling errors. Right, so non-sampling errors are errors that result from sampling bias, non-response bias, or data entry error. And such errors could also be present in a complete census of the population. Right? So then the next set of error is called sampling error. Oops. Right? And that's an error that results from using a sample to estimate information about a population. This type of error occurs because a sample gives incomplete information about a population. Right. So naturally, this idea about having a population and taking a sample to try to try to find information about the population, naturally, the sampling error is going to occur no matter what. Right. So it's you know impossible. To, to not have sampling error. So I have here errors in sampling. I wrote these definitions maybe a little easier, um, shorter, um, to help you remember them. So sampling errors, they're the inherent error from using a sample to estimate the population, right? So just it's just something that naturally is going to occur because we don't, we don't have everyone in the population. Non-sampling errors are errors that result from the survey process. Right. So, you know, one way to calculate the error is we can take the statistic minus the parameter. So statistic, remember, is a measurement from the sample and the parameter is a measurement from the population. Right. So we're, we'll look at this in example one. So let's say that you want to estimate the average starting salary for recent recent nursing graduates from Maine Technical College. The recent graduating class had 40 graduates. You conducted a simple random sample to to um, to select eight students and found the average salary to be $59,052. Right? So in other words here, the population 
is the 40 recent RN graduates. Right. Um, so the sampling error. Right. Oh, and well, let's read. I didn't read part A. But part A, um, we're assuming that all the response told the truth. They answered their exact salary. They understood the questions and the sampling methods were done correctly. So what's the sampling error if you know the true average starting salary for the recent 40 nursing graduates is $53,715, right? So the sampling error would be equal to, so we take the statistic, so the measurement from the sample, so that would be um, the 59000 right? Because that's from... Um, $59,052, that's from eight people, right? A subset of the population, that's the sample. And then we subtract the parameter, which is the value from the population. Um, so that's the 53,715 number. And we can uh, get a solution, and, and I just hit equals and space, and OneNote gave me that um, solution for me really easily, right? Um, but, you know, another way you could get that answer is use a calculator and I'm just gonna pull up R and show you how to do some arithmetic and R just to get you comfortable with R because we're gonna be using it a lot um, so all I did was change the text size made it made it larger for you um, to be able to see so I can just type 59052 minus 53715 right just how you would type like in your computer calculator I hit enter and it spits out the answer. All right, so you can use R to do some basic arithmetic, right? Um, so I've often used R to do some ba basic arithmetic, like balance my checkbook, and my my family thinks that's funny, but um, but yeah. So five thousand three hundred thirty-seven dollars is the sampling error here, right? So that's the the difference between what we got from the sample and what's really what's going on, right? So that's, there's some air involved by sampling instead of just doing like a census, right? Like knowing every single, what every single person um, is making. And then just to help you understand the difference between sampling and non-sampling air, right? So this occurred just from, just from having a sample. Everything was done correctly but we still have some error. So then what type of error though would occur if one of the eight students lied about his salary, right? That would be an example of non-sampling error. Right. So it doesn't like that. I'm just going to put maybe a hyphen, non-sampling error. Um, I'll just put a hyphen there. Right? For some reason, it doesn't like that. I think the book spells it non-sampling with no hyphen and all, you know, all one, non-sampling being all one word, but um, Microsoft doesn't seem to like that. Right? So the idea here is that this error from the lying is resulting not from the sampling, um, it's, it's resulting from the survey process. Right. All right, so now we're I have some examples to go through with you. So I have five examples. Example five has a few parts. Um, so example two is, so, so these are giving us a scenario that has bias. We want to determine the type of bias and then suggest how um, they could fix it, right? A remedy. So example two, the village of Oakland, which is to conduct a study regarding the income level of household within the village. The village manager selects 10 homes in the southwest corner of the village and sends an interviewer to the homes to determine the household income, right? So something that should stick out to you, so part A, is that this would be sampling bias, right? And that's because um, 
you know, the homes in the southwest corner may have different demographics than others in the village. Right, so it's maybe not a good a good sample, right? So there could be some potentially bias there. A remedy would be you could use a simple random sampling or you could do cl cluster sampling with um, maybe city blocks as the clusters right either one of those right and we've talked talked about those sampling methods but you know using one of those sampling methods I think makes sense um, and naturally when you're you know it's kind of it's a very classic um, example of cluster sampling is where you have things split up in city blocks right so example three um, deals with Coldstone Creamery so Coldstone Creamery is considering opening a new store in O'Fallon before opening the company wants to know the percentage of households in O'Fallon that regularly visit an ice cream shop the market researcher obtains a list of households in O'Fallon they randomly select 150 and mail a questionnaire that asks about ice cream heating habits and flavor preferences right so sounds good so far of the 150 questionnaires mailed four are returned All right so that's not a very good response rate right four out of 150 that's a really small value right like if I come over here to R four divided by 150 um, is you know that's less than three percent right that's really low number so part a uh, this would be non-response bias so that's because it has a very low response rate Right, less than three percent is what we found. So then part B, a possible remedy, is they could try sampling again with a different method time. Right? So another thing is they could try offering an incentive. Um, another thing they might consider is when they switch the method, maybe do face-to-face -face interviews with a trained interviewer. Right. So those are all possible remedies. Example four says determine the public opinion of the police department. The police chief obtains a cluster sample of 15 census tracts within his jurisdiction and samples all households in the randomly selected tracts. Uniform police officers go door to door to conduct the survey. Right. So something that should be sticking out to you is they're asking about your opinion about police officers, but the people that are doing the survey are uniform police officers. Right. So um, naturally you know as you could imagine that's going to create some bias right people you know probably aren't going to answer very truthfully honestly might be you know um so there there's going to be some response bias here so respondents aren't likely to give truthful responses possible remedy is to use a trained interviewer all right so then example five i have a couple of parts here um this first question says discuss the benefits of having trained interviewers 
So I would say you're going to have better survey results. Train interviewers can elect responses. Whoops. Um, I think that's right. Um, can elect responses. I think it's E L I C T. Hang on one second. Nope, that's right. Microsoft is right. I won't argue with them. All right, so interviewers can elect responses to difficult questions. All right, so in other words, if there's a really difficult question to answer or you know, maybe people are uncomfortable answering, if you have a good trained interviewer, they might be able to um, you know, get answers for that. All right. So those are some benefits. The next question is discuss the pros and cons of telephone interviews that take place during dinner time in the early evening. So we want some pros. Or I'll give one pro and one con. How about that? So one pro is that there's a higher chance of making contact with individuals right if you're calling early evening during dinner time a lot you know it's a good chance to catch people people probably home you know got home from work visiting with their family and getting ready to have dinner but a con is that people may get upset um, about being interrupted during dinner Right, so um, you know, some people might not get angry, but I think a lot of people would, right? Like, why, why are you bothering me? I'm trying to enjoy dinner with my family. All right, so the next is, why is a high response rate desired? How would a low response rate affect the results, right? So we're going to get better survey results with a high response rate. A low response rate may mean that segments of the population are underrepresented or that only individuals with strong opinions have participated. Right, so that's always um, a concern if you have low low responses. Um, you know, it might indicate that only people that have really strong opinions, like for or against, responded. You don't have a lot of that middle ground. Right, so those are all all things to consider. Um, uh, and also, we might we, we might have some under -rep representation going on. Right. The last thing is discuss why the order of questions or choice in choices within a questionnaire are important in sample surveys. So changing the order helps prevent bias due to previous question answers or situations where respondents are more likely oops forgot the k more likely to pick earlier choices all right all right so that finishes this section so um highly suggest you read over that section if if you um need some more help and let me know also let me know if you have any questions thanks